there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. I need to, uh, I need an ambulance as soon as possible, sir. Okay, sir, what's your address? Uh, sir, I have a, we have a, a gentleman here that needs help and he's not breathing yet. We're on our way, they're on our way there, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, he's pumping, he's pumping his chest, but he's not responding to anything, sir, please. And we're just getting this in uh, right now, uh, and, and it's uh, very, very sad news that Jim Moray and to all of our viewers, both the Los Angeles Times and CBS News are both now reporting that Michael Jackson has died. CNN has not confirmed that, but the LA Times and CBS News are reporting that Michael Jackson, 50 years old, the king of pop, has died. June 25th, 2009, saw the passing of a true icon of entertainment. The death of Michael Jackson reverberated around the world, leaving millions of fans in a state of shock and sadness. Losing such a notable figure not only meant the end of the most successful music career of all time, but the loss of an artist who left an indelible mark on popular culture. Never out of the public eye and often subject to rumor and controversy, he was also a figure whose music and videos brought innovation and high quality to the industry, who helped break racial barriers, and who also contributed millions of dollars to charities around the globe, either through his own Heal the World Foundation or as an anonymous donor. Michael Jackson was a man who was truly loved by his fans and who loved them back equally in return. Michael Jackson is a symbol which is greater than himself. His biggest contribution isn't a particular record. It's a style of music, an approach to music making, which found its apotheosis in the early days of MTV. He was the most instinctive musician I've ever met, the most talented, basic, deep musical person. His music managed to embody so many different styles also from rock to pop to classic soul feels, dance tunes. He influenced so many artists throughout the industry. I mean, the greatest artists in the world will all say, you know, who your influence is and everybody always says Michael Jackson. He was one of the great, almost old fashioned performers because he was an all round entertainer danced, he sang, he used visual image in a way that was really imaginative and really magical. Michael was sincere and real. Regardless of what you read in the press, regardless of what people say, regardless of the talk show hosts, the, the comics who make fun of him, the audience knew Michael's real.
Michael Jackson's rise to the top of the music industry was very much a public affair and has been well documented. The boy who had become the undisputed king of pop started singing with his brothers at the age of five and after spending several years touring and playing concerts, they eventually auditioned and signed to Berry Gordy's Motown label in 1969. Although billed as just nine years old, Michael was in fact 11 and from their first Motown single release, I Want You Back, it was clear that the band, and particularly Michael, was set for superstardom. There was something special about the Jackson 5, the minute you put the needle down on I Want You Back, because you hear that fantastic instrumental introduction. That was the first thing that caught my ears, was the string sound of this record. And it was a classical sound that was rhythmic with the rhythm of the track. And I was so struck by it, the intricate patterns, the, the simplicity, but at the, the intricacy of it. And then you hear this voice, strong, commanding, athletic, and young. How could somebody so young be so good? You thought, okay, is he really 11? It was always about Michael. You know, there was this like gorgeous little kid who, so there's a gimmick of him being so young and so small and so cute, but he had like amazingly soulful voice that sort of belied his years. And I think of his brothers as being perfectly capable musicians, but you know, they were very much in the background. He, he, he was the real talent. that they were family, the fact that they were black, the fact that they had a father as a manager made them stand out from the rest. And the fact that they were, they had musical integrity. There was a, a whole era of, of kind of bands like the Supremes and things like that. But when the Jackson 5 came out as a boy band and as the original boy band, which sounds quite funny, but they were so credible musically that that made them stand out above the rest. They were so versatile and they covered all, uh, a whole range of black American music and, and soul music in particular. Um, and Michael Jackson always stood out right from the start. Their huge kind of global hit really was ABC and that's where Michael really came to the forefront. <laughs> song because it's a bit like a nursery rhyme but it's um, uh, extremely soulful and quite sophisticated as well it's like a really good mix so it actually appealed to a huge cross-section of people I don't think that um, you could make better records than I want you back or ABC I mean they're, they're purely exhilarating pop but with this fantastic um, soulful um, emotion, emotional force in them. I mean, Michael Jackson, when you heard those records, you could almost feel 
juice of joy coming forth. I mean, it was a, a complete saturation in the thing and a thrill that T was now part of it and that he was good enough to be part of it and he had a, a, a ludicrous maturity in his voice. <laughs> In the entire Michael Jackson memorial service, the moment that got me was when they just showed the still of Michael Jackson as Frank Sinatra. And this was from a performance of It Was a Very Good Year on a Diana Ross television special. Now to think that somebody who was 11 could dress up like Frank Sinatra, okay, it was a joke, but it also was serious because it said this kid is of the stature of Frank Sinatra. And he was immediately a major star. When I was two years old, I was four years old. It was a very good year for Simba's girls who played in the park. And when it got dark, we made up the swing. Motown had spotted Michael's individual potential, and between 1972 and 1975, he would release four solo albums for the label. In the same way that Diana Ross was promoted as the star of the Supremes, um, Michael Jackson quite early on was, was promoted really as the star of the Jackson Five. Um, and I think this was partly a Motown um, uh, thing. I think Barry Gordy liked to do that. He liked to really push the, the lead uh, singer um, uh, and, and really uh, groom them, I think, for, for a solo career as well. Funny thing is, even though at the beginning it was obvious that Michael was the standout talent, nonetheless, the group itself made such an impact that nobody thought at first you should spin this kid off. And those Michael Jackson solo albums were merely something for him to do in his spare time, a way to make money, obviously, but not an attempt to break up the Jackson Five. Michael's four albums under Motown, Got To Be There, Ben, Music and Me and Forever Michael, featured covers of tracks from many artists such as Smokey Robinson and Bill Withers and spawned a series of solo hits for the young star. Throughout this time, despite their already massive success, the Jackson Five had grown frustrated with their lack of control over their music and in 1975 they bravely left Motown and signed a new deal with CBS Records which allowed them greater creative input something that would only benefit Michael's rising stardom. They were very much um, identified as a boy band when they were with Motown, and it was, it was straightforward pop music. Um, they uh, were chafing at the bit, really. They, wanted, they were getting older. They wanted to um, do, um, uh, just have more, more freedom uh, um, and to be able to exercise their creativity. And I think it was, it was actually a really good move when they moved to CBS. As happened so often in show business, people thought, well, that's that. We've heard the end of them. No one believed that they could actually generate their own material. But they did have a successful period uh, with Epic. Uh, Gamble and Huff gave them their first British number one, Show You the Way to Go. And they had big hits, Enjoy Yourself, uh, Shake Your Body. Shake Your Body did over two million in the States. Very big record. But still, nobody anticipated what was going to happen with Michael. I don't know what's going to happen to you, baby, but I do know that I love you. Walk around this town with your head all up in the sky, and I do know that I want you. Let's dance, let's shout, shout, shake 
Having renamed the group as The Jacksons, they went on to release six albums between 1975 and 1984. Crucially, the move to CBS had allowed the songwriting and producing talent of Michael Jackson to come to the fore, with tracks such as Shake Your Body, This Place Hotel and Can You Feel It? This demonstrated that not only was there life in the Jackson brand, but there was another side to the child star who was fast becoming an adult. The other boys were more like young men growing up. They wanted to play. They, they all worked hard. All of them worked very, very hard. But Michael worked 10 times harder than anybody. He worked harder than me, because I like to play too. You know, it's time to play, I, I want to play. Uh, Michael could stand and, and talk to you, and you'd think he wasn't paying attention to you, because he's working out moves while he's talking to you and doing spins and, and you know, and you're talking to him about, okay, Mike, we got to get to the limo at 5.15 and, uh, and we, and, you know, the sound checks at 7. Michael, are you paying attention? Yeah, I hear you. 5.15 limo. And he's doing, he's, he's constantly thinking about what he's going to be doing or creating things in his head all the time. The other boys didn't work like that. The boys, um, Jermaine, uh, Jackie, Marlon, Tito, used to like to play basketball with the band members. They had a little basketball court. And Michael was always about working. It was time to work, Michael wanted to work. And he would often come to me and he'd say, Sam, would you tell the boys to come on, let's go? So then I'd have to go outside and say, okay, guys, let's wrap it up. And they, of course they're going, okay, we got, just got five more minutes. We're almost through with this game. I was like, uh, Michael wants to get started, guys, let's go. So Michael was, he didn't want to tell his brothers what to do because he was like almost the youngest. So he'd have me do it, which was fine. You know, that's part of my role as musical director is getting the band members and everybody you know, situated, let's go, let's get started. With Michael's professionalism and drive shining through, he made plans for more solo work. At the time, Michael wanted to do an album of ballads. And he wanted to use two people to produce that album. Walter Scharf, who has since passed away, who wrote Ben, and myself. And at the time, Epic Records, did not want him to do an album of all ballads. Even though he had contacted Walter Scharf and had told him about it and he had told me about it, the album never came off. But what did happen was a meeting between Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones in 1978, when the pair encountered each other working on the set of musical film The Wiz, in which Michael was appearing as the scarecrow. The pair connected and Jones agreed to work on Michael's next solo project, the multi-platinum selling Off The Wall. The first thing one noticed about Off The Wall was the cover. It is the first thing you notice. And he's in a tux. He's grown up. To avoid looking square, he had the album designers give the shoes sparkle. But this is now a grown-up Michael Jackson. He's 21. And he's a handsome young black man. That's the tragedy. No one other than himself thought he had to change his appearance. Off the wall, he looks great. I think the teaming up with Quincy Jones um, certainly sort of re released what I think of as, as the essence of Michael Jackson onto the world. It was, I mean, I felt that it was a much, there's much more funk to it. Um, you know, he was a young man now. There was no gimmickiness to it. He was grown up and confident, and it seemed a really great period for him because he was he was still a teen icon, but he he just seemed like a man who knew his own mind, who was a confident performer. <laughs>
stop till you get enough is just a um, perfect, perfect uh, disco track. He's always been a, a really good songwriter. He's, he's um, really good lyrics, uh, great ear for melody. Um, uh, and that, that's something that's almost overlooked slightly uh, in, in, because everyone's so transfixed by you know, him as a performer. The joyfulness, the voice is never better than, than when he's singing, don't stop till you get enough. What he can do, I believe, that other Motown singers don't, is, is that he floats on the falsetto and he can get a groove on the falsetto. <laughs> The skillful thing that he and Quincy Jones did was to release this album at the height of disco. People forget, because Off the Wall has lasted and most disco albums have not, what a challenge that was. To be danceable without being dated. Because of all the forms of popular music, dance music dates the quickest. Because dances, as steps, are novelties and they fall from fashion. And also dance music tends to use electronic machines more than other forms of music. And of course, technology advances quickly and things which sound cool and new sound dated very quickly. Off the Wall managed to avoid these challenges, partly because of the production, partly because of the performance, and partly because of the great songs. Very lucky to have the tie-in with Rod Temperton from Cleethorpes, of all places. But Rock With You was number one for four weeks in America. Huge record. When I compare it to something like Ben, <laughs> I don't know, there's just such a, such a massive leap. Um, so I, I suppose he's just starting to show his individuality um, and what he's capable of. It was wonderful getting to see Michael Jackson in his element in those videos that were so classic. And I remember seeing him, you know, sort of dance for the first time and, and just seeing his love for performance. He seemed so free and so open and so willing to express himself. And, and what he's done is he's seen the bridge from Motown to disco, the, the world of disco. And, and those songs, they're, they're as effective calling cards as in their time, the Rolling Stones doing I want to be your man, or the Stone Roses going I want to be adored, you know, don't stop till you get enough. These are, these are bonds, promises, com compacts with an audience, a, a, a massive audience, you know, uh, this guy can sing, this guy can dance, this guy's part of that, this guy's part of this, this guy's now, and then, then the guy has got his audience. So very, very strong album, and it made you think, my gosh, he made it. He, he made the cross from kid to adult, and now he's going to be with us for a while. Off the Wall proved to be a massive success for Michael. He had reinvented himself and broken free from the confines of the Motown production line, allowing his own personality to flow through the music. The album was received as a major breakthrough and was the first by a solo artist to spawn four US top 10 single releases, with Don't Stop Till You Get Enough and Rock With You reaching the top spot while follow-up singles Off The Wall and She's Out Of My Life both charted at number 10. To date, Off The Wall has sold over 20 million copies worldwide. Yet, at the time, Jackson remained unfulfilled despite the album's success and single Grammy Award win. Jackson's next album, Thriller, released in 1982, 
was to launch him into the stratosphere. I spoke to an executive of the company who I won't name, and I said, oh, how's the new Michael Jackson album? And he said, it's not as good as Off the Wall. I think he had been uh, fooled by the choice of The Girl Is Mine as the first single. It was a decent pop single, but it didn't give you any evidence that there was going to be a classic album. And uh, as 1982 turned to 83, no one thought the thriller would be as good as it was. And that's why it was so completely stunning. And of course, the Billie Jean video knocked everybody away. about Billie Jean was that Quincy Jones wasn't convinced. At first he thought, well, should we put this out? <laughs> um, and then it turned out to be one of the most successful songs of his career. What was startling about Billie Jean, and I remember uh, when it first came out, sitting watching Top of the Pops, and um, up until that point, Michael Jackson had been seen essentially as um, a disco star, really. Great disco, but a disco star. And then Billie Jean, uh, this went into totally new territory um, because it was combining dance music with new wave pop and with, with rock um, sounds as well. Billie Jean introduces what becomes a, um, a not um, a misogynist uh, theme would be too uh, strong, but certainly um, a very um, uh, confrontational uh, relationship with women in his songs becomes a, a, a dynamic. Um, uh, supposedly uh, inspired by an actual uh, stalker uh, style s scenario. Interestingly, it had this subject matter. And at the time, I just thought, oh, this is a near the knuckle topic being dressed up with icing. It sounds so good that you don't want to talk about the fact that it's about a guy denying his paternity. Uh, of a child. N now I look back and I think, is this for the first real sign of Michael Jackson's paranoia? Because once he was no longer working with Quincy Jones, the paranoia sometimes just came through full bore. They don't care about us. Scream. Was Billie Jean the first example of that? Whether it was or not, it was sufficiently surrounded by all these other elements that it made for a product greater than the sum of its parts. Billie Jean was the second single from Thriller and was released in January 1983. With this track, Jackson had created a sound that was truly unique and the single shot to number one in both the United States and the UK. However, it wasn't simply the strength of the song and combined video that was helping to make Billie Jean and Thriller the gigantic success it was becoming. In March that year, Jackson appeared alongside his brothers on a television special celebrating 25 years of Motown. And when he took to the stage alone, he came with a performance that would cement his place in music history forever. It's fascinating uh, to read that even the night before Motown 25, the TV special, he hadn't figured out what to do for Billie Jean yet. And so he uh, turned up the music all the way and let it control his body. That's in his analogy. When they did the show, the Motown 25, he uh, introduced the moonwalk. And it was one of the most amazing moments in television history, and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> She said. 
One moment of time that changes history. It was like one of those huge, iconic moments in music. When you saw him do that moonwalk, you were thinking, I'm seeing something unbelievable that I'm probably never going to see again in my life. And without sounding over the top, it was just like that. He created something so special, um, and he did. It was that one moment in time that changed so many things. And he won an Emmy Award for Best Musical Performance, just on the basis of that. I mean, you don't give any awards out for four-minute segments, but it was so astonishing. And uh, he was the uh, king of the world for a while after that. I think Billie Jean and, and the, the sequins, the, I think by then we had the white socks that were very prominent, all those, those little details, um, the moonwalking, you know, the sort of the head movements he did, um, the glistening hair, everything. Um, yeah, I mean, he was really, I think he's, he, was, he was very savvy. So, he, you know, he, he paid attention to every single detail. And those were things that were distinctively Michael. Um, you know, I mean, some, a pop star c could have got by just with the gimmicks, with, without the raw talent, but, you know, he had it all. Unlike Off The Wall, an album with firm disco and R&B roots, Thriller went on to demonstrate Michael's versatility as he experimented with a rock crossover feel on tracks such as Beat It, released in February 1983. What was special about uh, Beat It was that fusion of soul meets rock. It was that first time we heard that electric guitar and you're thinking, wow, what a line. I just remember hearing it. I mean, it's just like, it's like, it's one of those things that just never leaves your mind. Michael was very canny in the 80s. He's portrayed as sort of a bit elfin and fragile, but actually he was a very, he was quite a ruthless businessman at times. He was very astute about um, the kind of musical styles that would appeal to different audiences. Um, and uh, with, with the song Beat It, he really brought the rock guitar right into the centre. Um, in quite an unexpected way for a black artist. Um, and he had Eddie Van Halen playing, playing lead and um, uh, really kind of riffing away on the guitar. Um, but that suited the song and it suited the mood of the song. So it's like this really strong dance beat and then also the rock guitar. And I remember standing in the control room when we were doing the drums to beat it with Jeff Beccaro. And I mean, what can you say? It was amazing. It was just amazing. Of course, Jeff Carr is one of the best drummers in rock in the world, and he's playing on this. And it's a machine kind of grew, and then he's playing on top of it, and it's just scary how good he is. And it's just great. I mean, it's it was it was it was clear, I think, to everybody that we had some amazing music. Not only was Jackson making inroads with his music, but he had developed a distinct visual style that transferred into his music videos. Both Billie Jean and Beat It demonstrated Michael's ability to dance and incorporated complex narratives to a format that was essentially designed to promote a song. By the time the title track from Thriller was released in January 1984, making it the seventh single from the album, Michael was ready to take things further than any artist ever had on screen. I have something I want to tell you. Yes, Michael? I'm not like other guys. Of course not. That's why I love you. No, I mean I'm different. What are you talking about? Are you all right? Get away! 
To accompany the single release of Thriller, Michael Jackson employed horror movie director John Landis, and together they created a short film to showcase the song. Featuring a plot that revolved around Jackson being stalked by the undead and costing a record-breaking half a million dollars, the 12-minute long thriller, along with other videos from the albums such as Billie Jean and Beat It, helped change the way music videos are viewed today. Thriller changed everything in terms of the vehicle or video, because before that, it wasn't even really deemed as that important. It was a sideline that came with the track. But Thriller made video, it made it transport a message and a story. And then instead of the song being a song, the song became a story, a movie. Jackson utilized the medium to break down the barriers that were preventing his videos being shown to a wider public. When fledgling station MTV, then an exclusively white rock dominated channel, finally agreed to exhibit Billie Jean to great success, it was seen as a major breakthrough for the artist. By that time, Michael Jackson was so huge that MTV became the natural place to debut the full-length thriller video. So this was a real conquest. This was not something that was given to Michael Jackson on a plate. These videos went worldwide in a way that nothing that he'd done on the Motown years could, just because there hadn't been the distribution facilities. This uh, thriller video opened up uh, a whole new style of, of filmmaking, essentially, kind of pop music filmmaking. that with Thriller, it was very important to Jackson that he could um, uh, exercise his imagination. He had a huge imagination, and maybe this was part of the, uh, a reflection of the, the strange closeted childhood that he had. Um, I, I remember um, a friend of mine, a journalist, met the Jackson Five way back um, in a hotel in London, and he said that the Jacksons were just kind of normal boys apart from Michael, and there was something about him even then. Uh, he seemed to be in a world of his own and um, quite almost ethereal, um, and he sensed that even then. Um, and I think in Jackson's head, he, he had huge kind of... Um, uh, it's like this big cinemascape in his head. And um, I suppose the great thing about having that success and that money was he was able to realise it and he teamed up with John Landis, the, the director, and made essentially made the horror film he'd always wanted to make. The thriller the title track is about transformation. It's, um, as some people say, it's Jackson coming out um, in terms of body transformation. The, the, the video with John Landis is... Um, John Landis directed uh, American Werewolf, Jackson chose him, but John Landis reveals things about Michael Jackson and where he is creatively and where he is personally. Where Michael Jackson had arrived at the time of Thriller was to become the biggest star in the world. The album was an unprecedented global success and at its peak was selling a million copies per week worldwide and also earned a record-breaking eight Grammy Award wins. To date, Thriller, with its mix of R&B, rock, soul and funk tracks, iconic videos and inimitable sense of style, remains the greatest selling album of all time, with over 100 million copies sold. However, Michael's success was suddenly overshadowed when in January 1984, during the filming of a commercial in support of his new Pepsi endorsement, a pyrotechnic explosion set fire to the superstar's hair and left him severely injured with second and third degree burns to his scalp. It would be a major turning point in Michael's career, 
and six months would pass before he would step back out into the public gaze. Despite the setback of the pyrotechnic accident, Jackson pressed on with his relentless schedule. With his solo career firmly established, a split from the Jacksons was inevitable. In July 1984, the family embarked on the Victory Tour, which was to be their last. After playing to sell out audiences across the United States and Canada, Michael, having donated his $5 million fee to charity, went back into the studio with collaborator Quincy Jones to begin work on his next album, one that would portray the star in a whole new light. There was a lot of anticipation about um, the next album after Thriller. Uh, it took Michael a while, about five years, um, and no wonder, you know, <laughs> how do you follow up Thriller? Oh, he was well conscious of the, uh, I, I wouldn't call it pressure because I don't think, he never showed to me that he felt pressure, but uh, he was just burning with ambition and he wanted to beat uh, Whatever the last album did, he always wanted to beat it. Bad was released in August 1987 and featured a slightly more stripped down sound playing on the hip hop and rap influences of the late 80s. However, the change in Jackson's music almost ended up taking a back seat to the radical changes in the star's appearance. I think Bad was an evolution for him as a person and musically. I think, obviously, the five-year gap between albums was time to grow, reflect, write, learn, travel, find himself. Um, obviously, he changed a lot on the outside as well. Um, I remember the first images of Bad and people being so shocked at such a big change um, facially and, and in the colour of his skin and all of these things which, which people began to question. But again, the music just spoke for itself. I suppose the word bad back then, when that came out, you know, and bad meaning good and all that, that, that was like, you know, it was, it was very much African-American um, lingo, so he sort of brought that to the pop world and, you know, there are even little articles in papers about, you know, bad meaning good and what it really meant. He changed his image in a way that um, was tougher, um, the studded leather belts, the, the, the tight trousers and boots and um, the kind of quite aggressive choreography. And Martin Scorsese directed the video and of course it's very well done and of course it's beautifully choreographed and Michael's performance is impeccable but it doesn't seem groundbreaking or sincere. with Bad that he was starting to follow trends rather than initiate them, just a little bit. I mean, it was still a great album, but there was just this sense of um, that he was uh, maybe not, not on top of his game in the way that he had been with Thriller. Of the three Quincy Jones albums, this is the least, but nonetheless still very good. But it's a transition album. There's no Rod Temperton. Michael Jackson wants to write almost all the songs. Uh, Cita Garrett gets in, as you know, uh, with her collaborator on Man in the Mirror. But Michael is becoming more and more his adult self. Bad went straight to number one and was the second single release from the album to do so, following on from I Just Can't Stop Loving You. Maintaining a high tempo and somewhat more adult feel to the album, 
Dirty Diana, another track to hit the top of the charts, continued to promote this new vision of Michael Jackson. Jackson was showing real versatility there in the way that he could move between um, dance music and rock music um, and uh, very convincingly. Um, and it was interesting as well that uh, he was um, becoming more overtly sexual and sexually assertive. Um, a song like Dirty Diana, I mean, there she is, she's a groupie and she's a predator and she's a seductress. And he's really getting into the, the, the song and the intensity of the emotions there. You never make me stay, so take your weight off of me. I know your every move, so won't you just let me be? I've been here times before, but I was too blind to see that you seduce every man. Tracks like Dirty Diana just reminded me of somebody losing their virginity or, <laughs> dare I say it, you know, the best partner of your life and someone completely blowing your mind. And it, I remember thinking, I wish I was her. <laughs> yes, it's goodbye to little Michael Jackson, that's for sure. And he, he is trying to be sexier. He's revealing more of his own flesh, which is interesting. He's grabbing his crotch. He's, he's being more overtly sexual in some of the lyrics. But it doesn't hold. It was like, you can't fool us. There's a sense of new, a new kind of grittiness, really, and a new um, uh, realism, sort of urban realism that he's bring, bringing in. And then that was very in tune with the time and in tune with the late 80s, where, I mean, Guns N' Roses were, were, were sort of massive and rock music was, was going through a renaissance at that point. So he was drawing on those influences. In the wake of Michael's death, one particular track has appeared as the song that defined his character best. Man in the Mirror was released in January 1988 and was a top three hit in the United States. Despite not including major Jackson traits such as an elaborate video and dance routine, the song demonstrated Michael's strong humanitarian nature. After his death, Man in the Mirror has become the big song. And, and it takes on an added poignancy. But at the time, it was one of a very nice selection of songs. It only got to 21 in Britain. Man in the Mirror is the most popular song after his death. It became the, the most uh, down, downloaded song. And um, in a way, if you were to say that one song was Michael Jackson's most honest song, Man, in the mirror and his most reverberative song in terms of how it would have related to other people to, to his, his fan base. Man in the Mirror underlined a long-standing trend in Jackson's music that called for world unification and peace. With songs such as Can You Feel It, We Are The World, and later Heal The World, Earth Song and others, Michael was able to express his desire to help people. As the 1980s drew to a close, Michael Jackson was undisputedly the biggest superstar of the decade and had achieved a status that saw his music and videos embedded in popular culture. As the 90s beckoned, there was to be a new direction for Jackson. In 1991, Michael Jackson released his eighth studio album, Dangerous. Having parted company with Quincy Jones, Jackson looked to infuse his sound with more dance and hip hop flavors and teamed up with producer Teddy Riley, who injected elements of New Jack Swing into the album. 
In an emerging decade where pop music was now giving way to new variations of rap and rock, Jackson aimed to conquer this ever-changing landscape. When Dangerous comes out, we've had another four years for music to change, another four years for him to change. And we're post Quincy Jones now, and the musically maturing influences, and whatever he may have done to tone down any excess sentiment there might have been, is gone. And there, was a, there was a falling out there, um, you know, because Quincy, in certain respects, perhaps took more credit than he should have for Thriller, because in fact, Michael was very much Thriller. Most of Thriller was there in the demos. I mean, Michael did do a phenomenal job of getting that album together. Quincy facilitated the completion of the album, did a great job too, but it was Michael's record. And so then Michael got mad at Quincy because he thought Quincy was taking credit for stuff that Michael had done, and then they had a little bit of a falling out. There's no restraint now. Michael is co-producing, he's writing, he's, he's in charge. And so we're getting a purer Michael Jackson. Eat this. Um, black or white was really a plea for racial harmony, um, and that's clear in the video. In the video, you've got um, everyone from Russian Cossacks dancing to um, uh, African tribes people, um, and it's clearly about racial unity. Um, and I think Michael himself felt very keenly that he was, he was, in a sense, representing all these different groups. I remember the first time, in, in all honesty, hearing black or white, I remember going, Oh, that's so cheesy. Thinking, oh, what a statement to make. Then I saw the video and I was like, I get it. I, when I saw the faces morphing into each other and not, you know, and becoming one, I was like, okay, I actually get what he's trying to say. It's, it wasn't cheesy at all. It was actually something really real. Protection for gangs, clubs and nations, causing grief in human relations. It's a turf war on a global scale. I'd rather hear both sides of the tale. See, it's not about races, just places, faces. Where your blood comes from is where your space is. I've seen the bright get duller. I'm not gonna spend my life being a color. Do you agree with me when I saw you kicking dirt in my eyes? Black or White was a big number one record in America, um, but it's not one of the lasting favorites in the canon. The, ra the rap dates it, for one thing. And that's the trouble of succumbing to novelty, trying to please too hard. Um, because rap had become popular, Michael thought, OK, I've got to incorporate a rap. You don't have to do anything, Michael. You're Michael Jackson. Just be Michael Jackson. Sing Ben. <laughs> Sing something like Ben, and everyone's going to like it. But by trying to please, he dated the song. Black or White was an undeniable success, and with it, Michael Jackson became the first artist since the Beatles to attain the top spot in the US within three weeks of release, and also the first American artist since Elvis Presley to enter the UK charts straight in at number one. While also topping the charts in another 17 countries, Black or White was truly a global song. Even though Jackson had dominated the 1980s, the 90s were proving tricky ground to negotiate. Dangerous had been produced with modern formatting in mind, 
and therefore its 77-minute runtime would be more suitable for CD rather than vinyl. The modern feel also transferred into the music, as Michael fought to retain his relevance in the new decade. Dangerous, it came out in 91, and it just showed Michael, as ever, his finger on the pulse. You know, he was really aware of where music was travelling. He's been criticised a lot for becoming white, in a way, uh, and becoming less black. But he's always had the support of the African American community and, and um, the black community generally, and I and I think it's there in the music. It's like he never abandoned. Uh, okay, he might have changed his skin colour, but in terms of his music, he never abandoned his roots in R and B and soul music. Um, and uh, with Dangerous, um, a track like Jam just shows how. Um, totally up to the minute he was with, with the new kind of black urban dance beats and incorporating it in a way that was really sophisticated. Everybody loved Jam. Everyone around me was like, have you heard the new Michael Jackson track? It's amazing because it was cool. And I know like, you know, because for us it was like Michael Jackson, 80s, great and everything, legend, but not cool, 90s cool. But when he came out with Jam, it was like so cool. Jam was a steady success for Jackson. And with nine single releases in total, all charting well, Dangerous maintained his place as the leading artist in the world. However, although his music was critically well received, Jackson himself was now under fire as tabloid rumor and speculation began to spiral out of control as he appeared to become increasingly more eccentric. Released in October 1992, Michael wanted Heal the World to be another global anthem to highlight the need for change. Yet in some corners, his stance on this appeared as over-sentimentality. It only went sour when he started to project this image of the semi-messianic personality, but the flowing shirt with the wind machine and uh, the earth song, Heal the World type sentiments, the type of stuff that Jarvis Cocker was uh, demonstrating against. Uh, someone who'd been around a long time w w would be uncomfortable with this. He was not born to this, he made himself this. And sure, there were some, some young fans who, who believed him and followed it, but you knew that this wasn't healthy. In a special appearance at the 1993 Super Bowl, Jackson performed Heal the World to a television audience of over 100 million people. Today, we stand together all around the world, joined in a common purpose, to remake the planet into a haven of joy and understanding and goodness. No one should have to suffer, especially our children. This time, we must succeed. This is for the children of the world. There's a place in your heart, and I know that it is love. And this place was brighter than tomorrow. We have um, 
the media, possibly especially here in England, you know, compared to America, this is just like very negative and loves to rip people to shreds. You know, because Michael really did do some, you know, amazing things. He clearly cared about the environment. He clearly cared about so many causes and genuinely, not just for show. Before taking to the stage, Michael Jackson marked his return to Britain with gifts for disadvantaged children. He presented the Variety Club of Great Britain with six coaches. They'll be used to take children from around the country to his other UK shows before being given to schools. I'd like to say uh, children will always hold a special place in my heart. So from Hilda World and myself, I present uh, this present. There's more where this comes from. Thank you. That wasn't really so much focused on as his weird eccentricities. So, I mean, that in itself is very sad. You know, clearly had, I mean, you know, we all have different sides to us, but clearly at least one part of him was, was kind, caring, you know, had a conscience. We didn't hear very much about it. You know, he had the heal, the world, trust, and he, you know, he's one of the celebrities that have given the most to charitable causes. Michael, it's now my great pleasure to present you with a check for one million dollars. This represents the money Pepsi-Cola pledges to raise in Europe this summer with our best wishes for Heal the World. And yet he was so quiet about it. It wasn't something he particularly shouted about. Um, but he really echoed his thoughts through his music. Um, tracks like Kill the World and Man in the Mirror and Black or White all had this come together feeling and kind of unity feeling about it. Michael started the Heal the World Foundation in 1992, the purpose of which was to raise money and awareness of the plight of children around the globe living with disease and poverty. Since its inception, the charity has raised millions of dollars for the causes it supports, including many donations from Jackson himself, as well as the entire profits from his dangerous world tour. I think Dangerous was, was really the, the... In lots of ways, you could see that album was the last of Michael Jackson as King of Pop and the, the main kind of global superstar. I think after that, his, his career went in rather more strange and bizarre directions. And in a way, he, he started to lose direction after, after Dangerous. Um, and that he had personal issues that were about to derail him. I ask all of you to wait and hear the truth before you label or condemn me. Don't treat me like a criminal, because I am innocent. In the summer of 1993, while Jackson was still at the height of his fame, he was accused of child abuse, prompting a media frenzy. The matter disturbed Jackson deeply and was settled out of court. Insufficient evidence also meant no criminal proceedings were filed. We have concluded that because the young boy who was, who was the catalyst for this investigation has recently informed us that he does not wish to participate in any criminal proceeding where he is named as a victim, that we must decline prosecution involving Mr. Jackson. Despite this conclusion, Jackson and his career never fully recovered. After a two-year absence, during which Michael had married Lisa Marie Presley, the daughter of Elvis Presley, he returned with a massive double album and world tour. History featured a disc of greatest hits and a second album with new material from the superstar. Although his fans did not desert him, the attention from the media regarding his personal life would not abate. And as he had done before, Jackson responded through his music by releasing the single Scream with his sister Janet. 
I think Scream was a really interesting track because, you know, one thing it did was sort of show that Janet, who, who was, you know, a pretty popular artist in her own right, it was cooler to say you like Janet than it was Michael at that time. So, so she was showing that she was supporting her brother. You know, she's in that video. It's a fantastic video. So it's, it's a hot song. I mean, it's a great video, isn't it? It's fantastic. Uh, done in that sort of uh, uh, spaceship uh, thing and you know this this uh, idea always around Michael Jackson videos that he's different that he's uh, he's another place you know and 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 and, and they're in like this this white space and um, all of these indignities that are being heaped uh, uh, upon him and it's that thing where uh, he's always making a compact with the audience always uh, uh, the, the feel this is my this is my pain this is my so but at, th at that point um, you know, as opposed to Man in the Mirror, where you know I really buy this kind of gentle eddies, and uh, I mean I think Scream's a great piece of rock. <laughs> When History was released, I bucked media opinion and, and went on breakfast television and said that I wasn't going to buy into this. This is a sad deterioration of a person who happens to be a great talent. Michael spent, or is reported to have spent, $7 million on that video. To spend $7 million on basically a complaint is extraordinary. I mean, what a distortion of perspective. You know, the cost of the video it was just a bit like, oh, come on, you know, do we really need to be spending that much money? Because it's almost like, well, you're spending that much money, but then you're talking about the fact that you want to be humanitarian. Spend less and give half of the budget to a charity. So I think that was quite a contradiction. <laughs> And to bring your sister into it, as he did with Janet, and to show that he was thoroughly unhappy with this aspect of his life, was distressing to watch if you realized that it was not entertainment. This is real. This guy doesn't like this press attention. He's in pain. He's bringing in his sister, who was an extraordinarily hot recording artist at the time, to help make the point. And he's spending seven million dollars to say, don't write things about me. I, I, I don't see how anybody could react in any way other than to say, this is really sad. If his life wasn't going off the rails, the train was shaking. That should have been a real warning to everybody. In typical Jackson tradition, Scream drew critical acclaim for its music and video and was a solid top five hit in both the United States and the UK. However, the reality of Jackson's relationship with media intrusion was somewhat overlooked, even though it had featured many times in other songs, such as Leave Me Alone and Why You Want to Trip on Me. With Jackson now seemingly a more fragile artist, there were signs of his loneliness evident on history in songs such as You Are Not Alone, which was released on August the 15th, 1995, and was the first song in the history of the Billboard 100 to debut at number one. You Are Not Alone is a really forlorn track. It made me feel very sorry for him. He came across as vulnerable, but it just showed me a whole new Michael. I mean, this isn't, this isn't the same guy who, who, who was out there performing Beat It and, you know, this dynamic, fantastic guy. It just seemed sort of beaten down when he came out with that track.
Yeah, there were certain songs on history where you felt an intense sense of Michael being alone there at the top. And it's kind of a cliche, but I think it's true that once you get to that level, uh, the normal family and community ties that you had that nurtured you um, seemed to drop away. And he did isolate himself more and more and surround himself by yes people and um, rather strange advisors. People in his position, it's well known that they get that they're at the top of a pyramid, and that there uh, there occurs in the, within that pyramid people who simply say yes, and uh, that's a problem for many people in Michael's position. Another day has gone. I'm still on. a detached air about these songs that something quite overblown but not really rooted um, in anything um, and it's sort of there in the music too the music's very grand and, and huge gestures but somehow it's not locked the beats aren't locked down in the way that they were his songs now I, when you look at songs like you're not alone they they become they're not it's hard to think of them as compositions so much as responses they are very mediated this idea that um, he he wanted to have uh, privacy well why would you uh, uh, be out doing what, what what he does he must feel this to want to do it because nobody would embarrass themselves that much or commit themselves that much unless they really felt it and uh, I did th think, this is a car crash, and I don't want to see it. History marked a significant downturn in Michael's career. Although a number one album worldwide, there was anger in the music that saw the artist focusing more on responding to or attacking the people who were trying to bring him down than anything else. With his career heading into a decline and his personal life and relationship with the media in disarray, Michael attempted to disappear further from the public gaze. During his history tour, he had married nurse Debbie Rowe and by 1997 had two children with her, although their relationship was not to last. On the music front, Jackson released a remix album, Blood on the Dance Floor, which saw various tracks from history remixed as well as a handful of new songs. Yet the album was seen as a disappointment to critics, and even though reaching the top spot in Europe, it went virtually unnoticed on the American market. Blood on the Dance Floor was amazing to me because I went away for two weeks. Uh, I think I was working on some project in America, and I got back. Michael Jackson had been number one and fallen out of the top 20. All in the space of the two weeks I'd been away. That told you about how quick the chart was moving in those days, but it also told you about how Michael's following was now concentrated among the Jacksonites who would buy everything first day and then it wouldn't cross over. It reeked a tiny bit of desperation to sort of make money and to sort of say, hey, I'm still relevant, I'm still, you know, I'm still cool. Pe people would buy absolutely anything Michael Jackson put out. You know, it would have a certain audience. You know, he'd never be completely forgotten, but. You know, it's almost like a, a person who's reached a certain age trying to dress in, in, in a teenager's clothes. You know, sort of started to get that impression a little bit. This was the situation he now found himself in. He'd lost the wider audience through this excess of sentimentality. 
it was questionable in terms of the motive because it's the one album that we don't see all oh, the reinvention we've had time out he's been writing he's come back with a new look there's a new this there's a new it was just like oh here it is oh and what is it oh there's a couple of new tracks but this is the body of what it is i question whether that was money oriented in that you know need to generate some sales need to generate some income things are happening we need to pull things into place and there was a little gap where you know he was obviously going through what he was going through and it seemed more like a stop gap album for me and it's interesting, that album, Blood on the Dance Floor, was a, a pretty good success in Britain, but it was a flop in America. And he went off the boil in the States commercially. Blood on the Dance Floor had demonstrated that Jackson's career was struggling to live up to his past successes. The King of Pop was being left out in the wilderness, while the public preferred to engage him in the glossy pages of celebrity gossip magazines rather than listening to his music. Having seemingly been away from the spotlight for nearly five years, Michael Jackson returned with his final studio album. Invincible was released in 2001, and was the first album to feature all new material since Dangerous 10 years earlier. Yet like Blood on the Dance Floor, it was only going to underline the fact that Jackson's relevance as an artist was passing. By the time he comes in with Invincible, he is, in American eyes, an oldies artist. He's not a current act. And the album only sells two and a half million, which compared with the previous figures is a disastrous fall. Of course, if someone had started off with two and a half million, you'd think, hey, this is great. But he really seemed at sea on that one. He was just clutching at people to write with, people to do something in the style of. And ironically, really, the most successful track was Butterflies with Floetry, which is amazing. If he could have been in touch with more quality young acts, like Flow a Tree, it might have been a better album. I think there was a slight air of desperation to those to that last album. I mean, it's interesting that for the Invincible album, Dr. Dre, really top hip-hop producer, was asked if he would do some production on it, and he declined. And, and I think that, that that's quite a moment, um, because... Ten years earlier, Dr. Dre would have jumped at the chance. Um, you, you don't turn down Michael Jackson, but it's interesting that he did at that point, which shows how much his career had really declined then. I mean, Jackson's tired at this point, I would say. I mean, not just tired um, creatively, but actually tired as a, a, a mentally, mentally in, in his ability to always... Um, well, to see the culture and to uh, utilise it, whether that be for himself or whether that be for the brilliance of music, that, that aspect, that, that knack, that, that spark is, 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 is hard to discern on, on Invincible. In comparison to his earlier works, Invincible was not able to compete and some critics were of the opinion that this was down to Jackson being out of control and lacking a figure in the mould of Quincy Jones to offer the star an occasional reality check. Michael's had everybody as much talent as he's always had. He hasn't lost anything. The issue, really, I think, Quincy centered things. And like recording the amount of songs, like this last album where they recorded, I don't know, 60 or 70 songs, I mean, that just wouldn't have happened. I mean, Quincy and Michael would have gone through, they would have picked the 10 or 15 or 20 best, eliminated all that other stuff, and, and they would have come down to 12 songs that were great because Quincy would have been a great advisor on that level. 
Quincy would say to Michael, you know, if Michael was going to, maybe Michael would be a little disconnected and make some statement that wouldn't necessarily fly too well out in the public. And Quincy says, you can't say that shit. And Michael would laugh and they would go, you know, I mean, Quincy was, you know, like a father to him on that level and was a straight shooter. That idea that who's holding Michael Jackson back, now nobody's holding him back, but nobody's, nobody's going to tap him on the shoulder and say, you know, because he's in a different world. And, you know, they, the people that are around him have got no, uh, they've got no end to, to do that because they, 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 they prevented that ever being a reality in the way that um, he's been allowed to uh, grow and become, uh, you know, inviable icon that he is. Due to ongoing contract wrangling with Sony, Jackson's final offering was not promoted well and there was no supporting tour. A special concert at Madison Square Gardens was organized to celebrate 30 years in music for Michael, which saw him perform with a host of other big names and also saw him reunite and perform with his brothers one more time. The 2000s were not the happiest of decades for Jackson. Despite celebrating the birth of his third child in 2002, Michael's world and personal life were thrown into the spotlight once again. A documentary by journalist Martin Bashir painted the star in an unfavorable light, but it was later judged by critics to have been biased and unfair. However, it did lead to more allegations of child abuse. Please keep an open mind and let me have my day in court. I deserve a fair trial like every other American citizen. I will be acquitted and vindicated when the truth is told. Greed begets greed. Mr. Jackson now realizes that the advice he received was wrong. He should have fought these actions to the bitter end and vindicated himself. The recent publicity about these settlements is unfair and damaging to him, his family, and his dedication to the world's children. The charges he faces are false and will be battled in a court of law within our justice system. He is innocent and will be vindicated. This time the case went to court and Jackson was acquitted on all counts. Jackson emerged from the courtroom taking the steps of a dazed man on a walk he must surely have wondered he would ever be free to make. During this time the star's health also came heavily into question as he began to look frail and world weary. The case had crippled Michael financially, and he retreated as far away from the spotlight as he could. With all the legal and personal issues in his life, music had taken a back seat. Various compilations and re-editions were released, but there was no new music planned from the artist. In 2009, Jackson made a surprise announcement. Having teamed up with AEG, he was to play 10 nights at London's O2 Arena later in the year. Tickets sold out in minutes, and the number of dates was increased to a staggering 50 nights, which also sold out, making it the fastest selling concert series of all time. Doubts were soon raised as to Michael's ability to complete such a gruelling residency in his current state of health, yet rehearsals were well underway and reports from the Jackson camp stated the star was happy and enjoying the preparations for his comeback.
However, it was never to take place. On June 25, 2009, Michael Jackson collapsed at his home of a suspected heart attack and was pronounced dead later that afternoon. History offers us precedent, and all the precedents tell us that the personal eccentricities of the artist are in time forgotten. Did Mozart really have Tourette's? Did he really go in for toilet humor? It doesn't matter, and we don't waste time thinking about it. We think of the artist, and so it will be with future generations who won't have lived through the Michael is taking a bath in Perrier stories. They will just have the records and the videos, and the work will speak for itself. I think when we look back, um, and then, you know, there's certain signifiers that will leap out, um, and the white glove, the military jacket, uh, the moonwalk, um, and those, those are the moments of true innovation, the, the, his falsetto singing, um, but particularly the dancing, that, that um, in the way that Fred Astaire did, uh, you know, it was like magic. I definitely think Michael created uh, certain, uh, certain styles that people take for granted, all the, all the younger kids who have come up since the 80s uh, take for granted. Um, we who are older saw that Michael was innovating and creating these things, but the use, the, the way the records are put together now, the use of uh, the way background vocals are stacked, uh, the way uh, the, the rhythm track is put together, uh, built piece by piece, um, the way the lead uh, works against the backgrounds and the, and the track. It's, it was all innovated by Michael. Michael Jackson will go down in history as one of the greatest entertainers of all time. Even though he will remain a tragic figure in the eyes of some, he approached his life and career with passion and a happiness that was infectious and the world will miss the undisputed king of pop.